accounting for labor. In this episode, we will be discussing valuing the inputs of labor to add to the total cost of a product. Now, labor is the human component of the factors of production. So when we talk about the factors of production, these are the necessary items needed to bring a product into being. So we have material, we have the labor and expenses. So we've already spoken about material. The labor are normally responsible for converting raw or semi-finished materials into its finished state. Labor costs can be categorized into direct and indirect. So direct labor are those that are directly engaged in the manufacturing of a product. Examples are factory workers, mechanical engineer, etc. Now the cost of direct labor can be further segregated into direct, where they are the remuneration paid for the activities of production. For example, basic and overtime salaries of direct workers. Now, cost of direct labor can also be indirect. So these are the wages not related to the production activities of the direct labor. For example, paying general bonuses of a factory worker, the ideal time being paid, maybe when it goes on leave or they are on break. Now, the second type of labor is the indirect. So here, these are personnel or employees whose efforts are not directly involved in the production of goods or services. Examples are administrative, maintenance, canteen staff. All costs pertaining to indirect labor are indirect costs, meaning their basic salaries, their overtime, bonuses, leave, and sick time pay are all indirect. So, for example, if you have the accounting staff, any money they earn, whether directly or indirect, to their activities in the business are indirect. So, remuneration methods. There are three basic remuneration systems for labor. We have the time work. So here, remuneration is paid based on the number of hours worked. Usually, a fixed rate per hour is agreed upon to be paid to the staffs engaged by the business. For instance, $50 can be said to be paid per hour. So if an employee works for eight hours a day, he or she will be entitled to receive $400 for that day and 2000 for five days. Employees may also be paid extra, that is higher rates as over time, for hours worked outside the agreed period. So let's say if an employee is engaged to work eight hours a day at an hourly rate of $50, he or she is likely to be paid an hour and a half, amounting to $75, that is the $50 times 1.5 for every hour worked after the eight. The second remuneration method is the piecework. Wages are paid based on the level of output. So an employee will be paid an amount, let's say $70, per every unit of production. So if they produce 100 units within a week, they will be paid $7,000. That is $70 per production times 100 units they have discharged. It is worth noting that there is usually a minimum guarantee pay for an employee with a piecework model. So if a business sets the minimum guarantee pay to be $5,000 per week and the employee only produces 60, ideally he or she is supposed to be paid $4,200. That is $70 and 60 units of the output. But since this falls below the guarantee threshold, the employee will take home $5,000 instead. The last remuneration method is the bonus or incentive schemes. Now, this is basically set to motivate or reward employees to achieve a set target. This pay is deemed as an addition to the standard and possibly over time remuneration. We move on to labor ratios. We will be looking at some parameters to gauge a business's utilization of its labor force. These ratios can be a useful tool to managing labor efficiently. The first we'll take a look at is the idle time ratio. Idle time is the period an employee will be paid for no work done. This may be due to machine breakdown or repairs and maintenance or the person going for a break. Now this ratio is essential to afford management how much is spent on non-productive hours to effect necessary changes if need be. Idle time can be normal such as regular breaks 
expected machine breakdown or routine maintenance, staff leave days, which are all being paid, etc. Management can do little about preventing such costs as they are expected or backed by legislation, for example, the staff leave. Now, abnormal idle time, on the other hand, are those that are unnatural and may be prevented, such as a breakdown of an ineffective machine. If the machine has been used severely, you bought it in a weaker state and it keeps breaking down, those idle time will be abnormal. If a staff is also unprofessional and stays beyond the stipulated break period, then they are abnormal. So these ones can be streamlined and prevented. The formula for idle time ratio is idle hours divided by the total hours available to the business multiplied by 100. Let's test our understanding. So a Jawa PLC produces paper bags. It takes two working hours to produce a pack of paper bag. On December 2021, a Jawa had produced 100,000 packs of paper bags, spending 55,000 hours. Let's calculate the ideal time ratio. So with the solution, the formula as we already know is ideal hours divided by total hours times 100. So ideal hours is 5,000 divided by 205,000 total hours multiplied by 100, which is 2.44%. It means of the hours available to the business, 2.44% of it is idle. The calculation of the idle hour came about by establishing the standard hours, which is the amount of hours that should have been spent producing the 100 pack. Two hours had been budgeted to produce every pack of paper bags. So for the 100,000, they should have used 200,000 hours, but they spent 205,000 hours, meaning the difference is the idle hours, which is 5,000. The second ratio is the labor turnover ratio. This ratio measures the rate at which employees exit the company. Causes could be relocation of the staff to other cities, retirement of the staff, illness which renders them incapable of continuing their duty, death, better offers from other institutions, etc. Now, this can have a direct impact on expenses, especially with the vacuum created by the exiting of the personnel and the replacement process. The higher the ratio, the more cost a business stands to incur. Now, some of the costs that can be incurred is a cost of selection, which can be advertisement in the media, interview panels being set, paid allowances to scrutinize the applicant and select the best. It can also be the inefficiency of the labor. Once they've been employed, they are not fully up to the expected capacity. So there will be some mistakes that will be made. The cost will also be borne by the business, which are expected. Cost of training, loss of output, increased wastage while the person is trying to learn to gain their feet. And lastly, the cost of tool and machine breakdown. When the person is not that competent, it will lead to machines breaking down and increasing in idle hours. Now, labor turnover can be reduced by paying satisfactory wages, instituting suitable working conditions, especially if there's a possibility of the staff working from home, establishing a harmonious relationship with management and the staff and within staff, proper training system implemented, the people should feel they have career progression in the business and improving the content of their job to ignite some challenge and adventure. Once they feel they have something to learn each and every day, it changes them to stay. The formula for labor turnover ratio is the replacement for that particular year divided by the average number of employees multiplied by 100. When we test our understanding, Manico on 1st January 2021 had 100 engineers. On 31st December 2021, only 90 were left. During the year 2021, a total of 20 engineers had left Manico. What is the labor turnover ratio? For solution, we state the formula again which is the total replacement divided by the average number of employees multiplied by 100%. So, replacement will be 10, we show the workings very soon, divided by the average number of employees of 95 multiplied by 100. It means that within the year 2021, 11% of the workforce of Manico left. For the workings, the average inventory is the 100 at the beginning of the year and 90 at the end, all divided by 2. So, to work for the replacement, we start with the engineers at the beginning of the year, which is first January of 100. Then 20 engineers were said to have left. 
Ideally, there should have been 80 left at the end of the year. But the question stated that there were 90 instead, meaning they replaced 10 of the 20 that left. The next ratio we'll be discussing is the labor efficiency ratio. So efficiency ratio measures whether labor was able to perform a designated task faster or slower. So if faster, it means the employee perform the set tax using less time allocated. This will mean less labor cost to the business and the employee may benefit or receive an incentive pay if the business feels generous. Now more costs will be borne where more money than budgeted will be paid to the employee if the task is performed using more time than planned. This might call for a replacement of the labor or an adjustment of the remuneration package. The formula for labor efficiency ratio is the standard or expected hours to make a product divided by the actual hours used multiplied by 100%. Let's test understanding. It is limited budgeted 10,000 hours to produce 50,000 units of spices. For the year ended 31st December 2021, they actually manufactured 70,000 units and actually took them 13,500 hours to produce them. What is the labor efficiency ratio? When we come to the solution, the formula is standard hours divided by the actual hours spent multiplied by 100. The standard hours was 14,000 divided by 13,500 multiplied by 100% giving 104%. It means that the labor was efficient more than they were expected. They used less time. So when we come to the standard hour per unit, it's 0.2 hours, which is the budgeted 10,000 hours expected to be used in producing the 50,000 units. Then we multiply it by the standard hours to produce the 70,000 units, 14,000. It means that the business expected 14,000 hours to be used by labor to produce the actual output of 70,000, but they used 13,500. In other words, we can do actual hour per unit, which is the actual hours used as 13,500 divided by the actual output of 70,000, which will give 0.19 hours. So the business expected labor to use 0.2 hours, but they used 0.19 hours. We move on to discuss labor capacity ratio. This simply measures if employees were able to perform all through the hours budgeted. In other words, if the business was able to obtain more or less of the working hours they budgeted to receive from labor. The more of those hours available to them, the better they stand at manufacturing more units and vice versa. The capacity ratio formula is the actual hours worked divided by the budgeted hours multiplied by 100. So if we test our understanding, GKE Limited budgeted 10,000 hours to produce 50,000 units of spices. For the year ended 31st December 2021, they actually manufactured 60,000 units and actually took them 11,000 hours to produce them. What is the labor efficiency ratio? The formula is actual hours divided by standard hours multiplied by 100%. So actual hours is 11,000. That is what the business got from the staff. They budgeted to receive 10,000 hours. Multiplied by 100 will give you 110%. So it means that the business got 10% more than they expected to receive in hours from labor. Lastly, we are going to discuss labor production volume ratio, also known as activity ratio. This measures whether labor have been able to produce more or less units compared to the budgeted outcome within the stipulated time. The formula is expected or standard hours to make a product divided by the budgeted hours multiplied by 100%. So when we test our understanding, Jury Map Limited budgeted 10,000 hours to produce 50,000 units of Hermes. For the year ended 31st December 2021, they actually manufactured 60,000 units and actually took them 11,000 hours to produce them. So what is the labor production volume ratio? So with the solution, the formula is standard hours or expected hours divided by budgeted hours multiplied by 100%. Standard hours will be 12,000 
divided by 10,000 multiplied by 100%, giving 120%. It means that the business produced 20% more than they had budgeted within the time space available or budgeted. With the workings, budgeted hour per unit is 0 0.2 hours, which is the budgeted hours of 10,000 hours divided by the budgeted production of 50,000 units. So when we come to the standard hours, that is how much was produced within the allocated hour of 0 0.2 is 12,000 hours, which is the actual production of 60,000 at the budgeted hour of 0 0.2 per unit. Here, the business is just concerned about the productive result of the labor. So they were supposed to produce 50,000 but they produce 60,000. So the business is okay. Thank you very much for watching. God bless you.